Hi, beautiful New Earth souls. A wholehearted welcome to the Trust in and Surrender to the Great Unknown Summit. We have a beautiful lineup of speakers, and today is no exception because it's my privilege to introduce to you today a speaker called Cater Brown, and he's done some amazing work um, giving ceremonies, and he will share a lot more about that. And today he is actually going to speak to us about the calling of the sacred river and place where spirit meets the bone. Uh, so yeah, without further introduction, Peter Brown, welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. Good morning. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. great to have you. Like I was saying, just before we started this recording, <laughs> I was so curious on, yeah, to hear more about your wisdom and your teachings about this topic and also uh, why you chose this topic and uh, a little bit about your journey also, mm -hmm. like your bio, how did you get to be where you are today? Well, that, that would, we, we would need several summits to cover that one, but <laughs> including all the pitfalls and wrong turns that, that uh, mostly contributed to how I got here. <laughs> um, I would say how I got here. Um, what I understand today, it is more of a remembering of who and what I came here to do, um, as it's understood and in a lot of indigenous cultures that this is not something we uh, download with enough information through education. Um, it's something that gets activated from within a memory, what we might call a bone memory, uh, an ancestral memory of, of this gift of medicine, this, this, uh, that we came here to offer. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I understand it now in terms of how I got here. The story is much longer and weaves through different experiences. Um, but this, uh, I, I share uh, what I, the calling, when we the, the title of this being the calling of the sacred river and the place where spirit meets the bone. It is, uh, rivers call us. They, they water is a, it, it calls people gather around water like we gather around fire. These are elemental forces and allies that, that call us into connection, call us into community, call us into sacred space. Um, and in many stories, um, the sound of river water or, or a river is what, is what is heard. It's like when we talk about listening uh, to, to that unknown, like in what form do we hear it? Um, so river water, if we're out on a hike for somewhere and we hear river water, it's like our attention attunes uh, to a deeper listening. So in many, many stories um, that I know, river shows up as a elemental, uh, we could say guardian or gatekeeper uh, to connecting with the unknown. And, um, and even beyond that to what we would say is the unknowable. So yeah. <clears throat> this idea of uh, the calling of the sacred river um, and the place where spirit meets the bone is the name of a poem uh, that I wrote back, I think it was 2012, um, that speaks of this. And um, I'd like to share it with you as a is a, an invocation or a starting place for our time together. Uh, and what I can do for your readers is share my screen so that it'll be on the, uh, the screen as well so that they can see it. <clears throat> so it's called Where Spirit Meets the Bone. There's a place in the heart of a lion like that which lives in your heart hunting, stalking, scanning over open field, water, and rock. That which you are searching for is also searching for you. Years pass, and the passion and the single focus determination hold you to the hunt. Other years pass, and lost in your despair and surrender, 
the hunt will simply not let you go. This quickening in the heart of a lion, not unlike yourself, is not marked by arrivals or acquisitions. It is the place where spirit meets the bone, the place of action, beauty, and love, unshadowed by thought. Easing forward, held by grace, guided by faith, to touch the unknown, where one can only hear the undecipherable whispers of the unknowable. There is such a place in the heart of a lion as there is in your heart. So that's a, a poem called Where Spirit Meets the Bone. And it, uh, it speaks of an experience of, um, you know, when we talk about these times, like the title of your summit and, and how to, how to navigate such challenging times. Um, the people that I find that navigate well um, have touched that place or have, a, have at least a roadmap, a sacred roadmap of how to reach that place. Um, so my work, back to my story, um, in my youth and, and education through college and graduate school and becoming a psychotherapist and then probably at the age of, I think it was 28, I began to um, move out of traditional psychotherapy and began to study with indigenous elders and begin to look at their cosmologies or medicine wheels of understanding ourself in relation to creation. <clears throat> and um, so I began to blend that world of ceremony and ritual uh, into the psychology and then eventually found myself leaving behind more and more of the psychological way of referencing and uh, the psychological roadmaps um, and embracing much more of an indigenous uh, perspective of seeing the world around us and inter how to interact and um, essentially how to live your life as a ceremony um, as opposed nice. to just something one goes and, and does. <clears throat> so this, um, you know, when we talk about the uh, the unknown. Um, the unknown is something we can eventually know. However, the unknowable is what requires, um, well, I would say it even goes beyond faith. Faith being some, often some set of constructs uh, that still fit into a map. Um, but I think once we leave that behind, which often comes following a great surrender, you know, uh, what I call to be broken open from the out from outside forces, not from some kind of self choreographed letting go ceremony, but when outside forces break us open, mm -hmm. like loss yeah. um, of all kinds, um, disappointments, tragedies, illnesses, and accidents. When we are broken by life's uh, outside forces like that. Um, and we find, and we go to that place of, of what I call uh, open palms and, and open heart. Um, all we can do there is ask. And if we don't have anything in that place to reach for um, or reach out to um, that we have some understanding of, then it gets really dark. Um, and that simply could be a mountain. It could be a river. It could be your own understanding of the sacred. Um, it could be a, a, a roadmap to the sacred that you were born into and, and that you uh, have made your own. Um, but this, um, so as my, in my ceremony work as a vision quest guide, <clears throat> essentially helping people prepare for this uh, death and rebirth passage, ceremonial passage. And, um, and you, uh, in preparation for that, you, you prepare uh, as if uh, you were preparing for your death. So that you, in a way, we don't say you want to have a good death. It's, uh, there's an old blessing that says, may you have a good death. And what that means is, may you have a, a rich and beautiful life. Because we understand we, we often die how we live. And so this... Uh, one of my favorite analogies is when we think about our life beginning uh, with birth and running along the timeline, 
that ends in this lifetime at death. We can think of rites of passage, initiations, vision quests, walkabouts, hill walking, all these um, initiatory descents of soul as running opposite the flow of life and that they begin with the death and end with the birth. So we're in this, uh, in this past, this initiatory passage or as a rites of passage guide, people often show up uh, in times of great darkness. You know, something has, like, like for many people in, the, in, these, uh, in these days, um, all the old roadmaps that they have learned to, to navigate the, their lives by don't work. And, and it's like looking at the map and all of a sudden it's, it's no help. And um, so it's like we have to learn to, uh, we could say metaphorically learn to navigate by the stars again. We have to learn to listen more deeply pay attention more, more clearly and navigate um, in relationship to that unknown or unknowable. Um, so this, and that, the other part about the water, um, <clears throat> the call of the water in ritual, um, if we think about in, in ceremony and ritual, we can think of two primary trajectories kind of like that river I talked about this way. This one kind of runs like this. So that um, initiatory experiences we, we say are of, the, of the fire element are those initiations of ascent. Those people in an initiatory ascent um, are, are just on fire. Um, and, and some would say, like in, in some traditions say they are possessed by a creative genie or genius, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's got a hold of them. Mm -hmm. And in these experiences, these things can also kill you. Um, they, people have to, have, a, have to learn how to navigate with that intense energy of, of manifesting force, or it can, it can really destroy you. The other form of initiatory trajectory is, is this way, and that's down, and that's uh, through the, the element of water. And so the initiatory process, uh, the call to the river is a call to healing, uh, reconciliation, ancestral memory and reconciliation that way. Um, so it, it follows, uh, often follows along ancestral lines of, of healing the brokenness that, and how that brokenness might show up in my life. And so that's what we call an initiatory descent. So water, um, takes us to that place of surrender in, in that initiatory way, in a ceremonial way of, of um, you know, of, of being broken open or of surrender. Where um, what I say is that we, we surrender uh, like the, the spirit of winter when it's really cold and, and where it's, it's uh, energetically a time of stillness, a time of storytelling, a time of letting go, winter. And this type of letting go is, uh, is akin to letting go so deeply that spring simply shows up because we let go enough and only because we let go enough. And it's that, that place where we, where we touch that, that surrender that grace comes in. Um, it's not manifested by a create your own reality thinking. <laughs> grace has its own timing, otherwise it wouldn't be grace. And yet it's in those moments that there's this, uh, you know, the, the, the piercing light of liquid grace enters those darker places in our spirit and begins to, to, to shine some light. And, um, and that's the unknowable to me. That's the... That's where we're, we become opened uh, to be uh, supported by grace, guided by faith, as the, as the poem says. Um, can, and so you, on, can, yeah. you like, can you explain mm -hmm. the difference between the unknown and the unknowable like a little bit more? Yeah, so <clears throat> we often go on search to, to understand the unknown. 
Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're investigating the unknown. Um, and therefore, it's easy for you to know about the things you don't know. You right. know what's wrong, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, yeah. But how do you become aware of the things you don't know you don't know? That level. You wouldn't even think to, the, the, the inquiry would have never have crossed your mind. And yet that's the larger field of the mystery. That's the larger field of, of what holds us all is uh, all the places that we don't know, we don't know. Um, so to, uh, as, as Joseph Campbell says, uh, many years ago, I said that the, the greatest things in the universe um, are those things that cannot be named. And the second greatest things in the universe are all the names we give it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, that's a that's a little um, defining, I guess, between those two those two yeah. elements. Yeah. It's always good to uh, to have a mentor or a teacher or a, an elder in your life that's you know navigated further down the road that you're on, mm -hmm. um, because they can call your attention to the things you don't know you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All you would know to ask about is the things you don't know. Right. That's just this much, you know. Yeah. And, 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 I love uh, that. It's like the so, blind spots, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And yet the unknowable remains such, right? So the, yeah. that which is unknowable cannot be reduced to a construct of thought or meaning or understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It it can it can be an experience of aliveness. Can be an experience of grace, mm -hmm. uh, but to cloak it in words or, or to give it form uh, only lessens the experience. Of course, yeah. about those things that um, we have a very deep personal experience, we want to share it with somebody, and we just can't find words. Yeah. Or, or an artist who has this this uh, image that they just resist putting on the on the on the paper or the palette. Yeah. Because they, the moment they do that, it, it, it's less than what they experience. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's this, uh, this idea that, you know, what, what we are, it's not that we're searching for a meaning for life. It's more about we're searching for an experience of being alive. And that's, again, <sighs> that, that, that little shift there. Um, mm -hmm. That place in the poem where it says, um, un, unshadowed by thought, which is not a reference to impulsivity. <laughs> it's a reference to awareness. I'm going to need like an, uh, a day to integrate everything you're saying this call. <laughs> so much. Well, let's, let's think of an example. Um, well, here's one of my other favorite analogies, and then I'll stop at the analogies. No, I like uh, analogies. It's good. <laughs> uh, ritual is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And because when you're in it, it's not for the mind to be making sense of. You're engaged from a sensory and sensually uh, experience. Your thoughts aren't like running. You're in it. If, if you and I were sitting in the same room right now, and I often do this with people when I'm in the physical with them, I'll pick up some objects sitting around me. So if I grab some car keys, and I would toss them at you. And you would instinctively reach up and grab them if you were quick. Yeah. And then I said, um, John said, well, what, when, that, when that was keys were coming at you, what were you thinking? The habit would say, well, I was thinking about, I better catch these keys. And I said, no, you aren't. Think about it. Go back. And he said, actually, I wasn't thinking anything. I was just reaching and getting the keys. Yeah. Um, and so this awareness uh, is, is what goes to sleep when we live our lives out of habits. Um, so when we're talking about accessing the sacred, accessing the unknown, to guide ourselves through periods of anxiety or stress, um, it's like uh, what I tell people first, well, the first thing I'd like you to do is to sit really still and eliminate distractions and watch where your mind goes. 
And don't try and do anything, just watch it take off. Um, and so that's the first place where attention, because um, it prevents you from, from being aware in the moment. It's a habit. Yeah, yeah. And, um, or, or this, uh, here, or here's an example, actually we can practice on video and all the, all the watchers. Um, so if I, if I took my hands and take your hands, kind of link them together and cross your thumbs like that. Show me where you're, lift up your hands, let me see. Okay, so uh, when I look at my thumbs, my right thumb is on top of the left thumb and therefore my left finger is on the bottom. Which one is for you? Yeah, my right thumb. Right thumb, okay. Yeah. So here's what I know about you is that every time you sit back and clasp your hands together, your right thumb always goes on top. Okay. It doesn't ever just go the other way because now switch. Put the other thumb, drop it down one and drop all your other fingers down one. So you're now your right fingers on, little fingers on the bottom and your left thumb is on top. And so that it feels, feels weird. It feels weird. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I like to remind people that the word weird is a, um, I think it's a, a Scots Gaelic term meaning magic. <laughs> 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 So it feels weird and it feels a little kind of like it can be a little bit even a little anxiety feeling. Yeah. Because what you've done is you've broken a habit that you didn't know you had. Yeah. And your awareness expands. Like the moment you break a habit, your consciousness expands. And where you weren't aware when you did this with your regular finger on top, your right finger. You didn't, you weren't aware of that, but the moment you switched it, you were keenly aware. It's like, oh, like you're aware of your hands, probably felt some energy in here, <laughs> like you were, your, your awareness expands. So think of all the habits of behavior or thoughts or emotions that we just operate by that we don't even know we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, habitual thinking, habitual feeling, habitual doing, and yet the moment we quiet those, and this is what happens on, on quest, on vision quest, is this stillness. Period of time in nature where you're, you know, four days and nights, you're in the wilderness, in, 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 in solitude. And so you break the, these habits and your awareness starts to expand. And in that awareness, uh, you realize that um, the sacred. And what I mean is, is, is if you want to experience the sacred, go anywhere, particularly in nature, eliminate all distractions and sit there for long enough and notice every detail of everything within 10 feet of you, or maybe, five, or maybe three feet of you. Doesn't really matter how far, just every detail. And when you notice every detail like that around you and allow nature to notice you, that in that exchange of acknowledgement between you and other, at, at that level, that place will become sacred simply because you have, have noticed it and it has noticed you. Um, so it, uh, it's a way of opening uh, to the unknown, opening to that experience of awareness and, and the sacred um, so and can i ask you something about that because i i've had an experience well, several experiences like that where mm -hmm. i'm at right now there's a beautiful lake and i go there like daily mm -hmm. um, but what happens is that i feel so connected and i feel so much love mm -hmm. that it's that I cry and it's mm -hmm. overwhelming and mm -hmm. then because it's so intense is what it feels like um I kind of close up or my heart like um I wouldn't say shut down but there's something that happens where I'm not receptive yeah. anymore Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like about about that because I'm sure that a lot of people in in the audience have mm -hmm. have this too that they feel very connected to nature and it actually overwhelms them all the the beauty and the love and mm -hmm. the yeah that they that they receive 
in that connection. I'll give you, so I'll give you a way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, when you connect with the lake, and so we're talking about still water. Yeah. I'm not running river. It's very different energy, but still water. Yeah. Um, and there's this overwhelming feeling you said of love and then of grief. Yeah. Um, and your grief is your water. Yeah. Um, and grief uh, as an expression or an offering of water is the conduit of, of deep heartful connection. Mm. Like when we feel, uh, when we feel grief in relation to something, we have, heartful connection it may there are different kinds of grief but this opening of grief um th that the the lake itself is is holding space for you mm. and it feels so welcoming and, and so inviting um there's a relaxing of of uh, protection um and and then so as you relax this grief that you didn't even know you were holding rises up it's just natural it, it what would be ideal is if you could just go with it and and let the let the uh the spirit of that lake hold you in that experience and just offer your tears uh um, as an offering to the water um it's uh there, there's uh, an understanding that um we say the ancestors are thirsty and what they're mostly thirsty for is the tears of the living because it helps them heal. Mm. As they heal, they help us heal. Mm. And so grief is, is seen as not a, uh, grief is not an individual dilemma. Mm -hmm. It's a collective responsibility of offering. So if we think of our, of our tears as actual offering, okay sacrament of water and a holy offering in exchange for what's being offered to us. Um, my, my intuitive sense is when I, when I earlier when I said the spirit of this particular lake, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean that specifically, there's um, places like this have different certain kind of energies, um, yeah. certain kind of guardians, um, and however we want to frame that with words, what we call it the Holy Spirit or the spirit of nature or, you know, a siren that's, that's connected with this particular lake, yeah. um, you have uh, entered into a, a vulnerability of, of invitation and being seen and, yeah. and they have responded and they yeah. feel you know, it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's like being held. And tears just are natural response. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling it right now. But I, but I also felt felt it with you when I was when I just saw your picture. Mm -hmm. It's it's I have I have it when when I just feel an embodied love coming mm -hmm. from someone, and like I don't even need to know them, but I just I know in in that instant moment i can feel that they're very connected to nature in whatever way mm -hmm. and that they have a deep reverence and respect and integrity and just a deep deep love commitment mm -hmm. and then that touches me so much that that it makes me cry yeah <laughs> tears are tears are beautiful you know tears uh um grief is never something i think of that i want to stop you know it's um i've lost both my parents and and my dad i guess 25 or more years ago now and and when i think about him in certain moments and the tears come up it's like oh i'm there it's like when the tears come to heart like there's connection um and so when i think grief is a uh grief bypasses all uh, discriminatory fences and protective barriers. It's just, you know, I, I do a lot of grief rituals around the world um, that are three, four days long and, and that culminates into a specific uh, experience on one night where we have a sometimes an all night grief ritual. But uh, in those moments of shared grief, 
there's there's no there's no thinking going on right. <laughs> there's those that are holding space and those that are in the space and they switch and and so we hold for each other but in the in the collective offering uh, of grief at an ancestor shrine um tremendous things happen and, and no words need be spoken i can't really they, they would just get in the way and connect people deeply it's like you don't even know their name or their story but all of a sudden you've you, you've connected at such a, a deep deep and honorable level with that grief so it's uh and then some people and, and you may be one of them i don't know yet uh, <laughs> what i would call tear listeners uh and they tear listeners um is a name i give for people that have a uh, in, in a natural empathic resonance to places that grief tends to hide out. And so they, with, with, with other people, if other people don't express grief, they'll feel it. Yeah. Um, yeah. They used to be called, and, and uh, a lot of my ancestors are from the British Isles, and, and so the wailing women, they would, they would do the keen, what they call the keening, and they would come into the home and, feel the situation out and then they would feel it in their body and they would just begin to keen and wail and soon as and as they brought that energy it would activate the other people that didn't even know they were carrying it and so they, this the, this is a name i call tear listeners they they listen and then they bring it forward and they help activate it with others and so um i've noticed this with people that uh, feel very deeply around grief um it's just a way of reframing it as in terms of, oh, I'm too emotional. So mm. no, you, you, this is your job description. <laughs> <laughs> you're it's like you, you listen for it. Maybe you listen in the landscape. Maybe it's not people, but maybe it's the land that you feel. Mm. Um, maybe it's planetary frequencies and energies. It's different people are attuned slightly differently in, in what, they, what they track at that mm. level. So um, what a suggestion would be if, if for you or, or any other with, with uh, the experience at the lake is um, learn, to, learn some of the history of the lake for the indigenous people, mm, yeah. how they understood this place, and then take an offering, um, a good offering to take to water is milk and honey. Okay. And make as an offering into the water, and just uh, you know, let let the this, the spirit of this lake know. It's like, a, thank you for seeing me, and I see you. just again an exchange, deep connection, um, and then become you know you you probably have you might have this particular place as an ally, meaning that it might tap on your shoulder at different times once you form a deeper relationship with it. Um, and that becomes a resource, an ally to, to navigate challenging times, you know, as, your, as the title of your summit indicates, um, is to develop these relational allies that, that we can lean into, whether it's our grandmother or whether it's a mountain or a lake or, or a name for the sacred that we've learned. Um, so those are, yeah, just the, these, these allies that uh, can assist us, human yeah. and non-human. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it's so, it's so beautiful that um, your topic is also about the river. I feel mm -hmm. very connected to water in, in general. Mm -hmm. And because um, and every time I go to the water, mm -hmm. I, I allow the grief to be there. And it's mm -hmm. not just like I allow, it just happens. It happens I'm there yeah. and it happens. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to think about anything. It just happens because for me, it, it, it's like so inviting. I don't know how to, how to explain that, but mm -hmm. it, like the water just brings that out in, in me. And, and I actually know that it's not just my own personal grief. Mm -hmm. And it, it never is like any any experience I'm having in in those kind of emotions is is always mm -hmm. something 
bigger as well. That's just mm -hmm. common sense <laughs> as, right. you're part, as you're part of a whole, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, the first layer is your personal grief. Mm -hmm. And then a layer down from that is um, the, the unacknowledged grief uh, of the other. And when I say other, I don't necessarily mean just human. Mm -hmm. um, uh, residues of, of emotion and, and uh, get, get lodged in the landscape yeah. when there's been challenge or un, it's just been unresolved or unacknowledged. It's yeah. like it gets buried in the ground and we stumble upon it and all of a sudden it, it's uprooted and then we feel it. Um, it's one of those early teachings I learned when I was unpsychologizing a lot of my formal training um, from one of my indigenous elders um, when I was telling him about something I was deeply feeling or thinking actually not that it matters which one but I was sharing something I was deeply I was thinking about and he said are those your thoughts and my psychological mind was like well of course they're my thoughts I'm telling you about them <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that wasn't the thing you know, it's like wait a minute let me see and then I realized I was just parroting repeating like no actually these aren't my thoughts i've just taken them on and thought they were mine and we can do the same with emotional energy and frequency yeah. uh, we understand you know the law of physics is that everything is energy at a core yeah. level thoughts yeah. are energy emotions are energy physical objects are energy mm -hmm. and, and so energy is and energy and other law of physics says energy can never be created or destroyed it just changes form so everything that ever was will always be. Uh, it just moves in form. And so people that are highly empathic um, are, are uniquely attuned uh, to sometimes thoughts and feelings and, and energies that you know didn't originate with them. Um, and it might be asking a, you know asking something of you. That's why I think this this particular lake find out how the indigenous people held that and understood that area and, and then enter into a conversation relationship where they take offerings even your tears you know to, to make an offering of your grief um and uh and yeah and just you know ask what what is it what is it that i'm i'm, I'm here what you know what a question i always like to ask people is uh don't ask yourself what does this mean like in light of the experience you have there ask yourself or ask the spirit of this lake uh, what action am i guided to take in light of this experience yeah like how can i be of surface so um, or is it even close, closer in not like how am I going to live my life? How can I be of service? Um, no, to the lake, I mean. When, when you're in that place and you, and you have that experience and you're, you're saying, you know, or maybe after you've left in light of this experience, what action am I guided to take today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tonight when I get home to speak with my friend, my partner, my kids, my whoever, what actions am I guided to take? So we bring it closer in. It's, mm -hmm. it's easy yeah not to take responsibility for our lives is if we put it way out there like what am i going to do with my life what action should i take with my life that's a big one um, yeah <laughs> that's a big one. what action am i guided to take this week today or this evening now and let, yeah. let that experience guide you and i always tell people as long as the guidance uh is within your integrity and with it you know um and does no harm it's not important that you understand it um, when you follow through with it then pay attention to what happens right after that because uh, often then something will show up sometimes very close in that moment sometimes it's soon after but when you're um like in the poem to be um uh, uh, held by grace, guided by faith, to touch the unknown, where one can only hear the undecipherable whispers of the unknowable. We're, we're in a relationship dynamic that we're not going to make sense of. 
Mm. But we say, is it is it bringing goodness into my life or others? Um, you know, have some principle of orienting yourself toward the the guidance. Mm. Um, and, uh, a good experiment to try out. It, it, yeah. or, it, it's uh, practical magic, they would call it. <laughs> I like that. I love, I love anything magic. So that's cool. <laughs> and why milk and honey? Um, what, you know, the, the, the quick and easy teaching, cause that's what I was taught. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is, uh, in that partition particular offering, um, is taught to me as an offering to water. Uh, both milk and honey are the uh, sustenance of the natural world. The plant kingdom, the animal, animal kingdom, yeah, uh, the insect kingdom. But this, this um, sweetness, and I think of it as sweetness and nourishment. Yeah. Um, so when you when you make an offering of sweetness and nourishment, it's an ex, it's an invitation to receive sweetness and nourishment. Mm. And so when whenever you uh, like if you're working with uh, the spirit of a river or, or a lake and you make an offering um, of such, uh, the offering uh, is an invitation to be open to then receive that which you have offered. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different places and different cultures around the world that I've heard that, that the milk and honey is, is the offering. You know, it's, mm -hmm some biblical context to it there's some some african context to it um and beyond that you know it's it's uh maybe we could write volumes about why milk and honey but <laughs> <laughs> what action not not what does it mean but what action am i guided to take <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> <This is> true <laughs> you offer milk and honey until you get another guidance said that was good now next time bring us some flowers or something mm. but it's again about relationship you know um, it's it's when we enter into relationship with the other and invite relationship with us that we um, have that experience um, along with all the others experience that relationships bring which teach us and challenge us and all that good stuff. Mm, yeah. I, mean, I want to be careful not to imply um, that there's any, uh, any particular road that enables us to have the spiritual bypass experience where, where you can just become spiritual without experiencing the, the fire of living and the, the alchemical process of of being in this world, uh, difficulty and challenge and heartache and all those other uh, juicy, heartful, hard things that are just part of the mix. Um, and, you know, it's, there's no way to get around it. <laughs> yeah. So in all of my conversations, like, oh, you know, let's, let's not imply that, you know, there, there's challenged um, and, and it's all part of it too. You know, it's, it's hard sometimes and it hurts sometimes and it's, you know, that that in in a sense wouldn't wouldn't you say that that is the initiation though that that is like yeah it it is and and also when we're in that place um, not to reach to to pull ourselves out of it with some neat uh, reframe that allows oh but you know how about this or mm. you know yes, these are dark times and it's going to, you know, it just means that this is going to happen. It's like, wait a minute, damn it. I feel like shit. And, you know, I want to scream and holler and, and, and weep and, and, you know, don't take that from me. Um, it, it's like, you know, the, the birth of baby in a certain, in, in the traditional way, you're going to have contractions and it's going to be hard um, before this life comes down um so there there's there's a there's richness in the in the difficulty and the darkness it's it's um we associate things beginning with light like sunrise mm -hmm. spring 
-hmm. in the old calendars, the old indigenous way of marking time when time began to be marked, the beginning began from, from an annual place, we'd say around the end of October, beginning of November, which marks in, in the Celtic tradition we'd call Samhain. And that's the, that's the place at which we enter the threshold into the darkest time of the year. It just gets darker and darker and darker. And so this, this dark soil, this is the beginning. This is the dreaming. This is where it's starting not when the sun comes up. And so time was measured by night, not by morning or sunlight, not by it's been so many days, it's been so many nights. Um, so in, in, in a way, um, the moon was that original uh, source of feminine wisdom that guided and, and beginnings, like with the new moon, you know, when we plant and we do certain kind of experiences on a new moon. Because it's in the new is not the slither, of course, it's the dark. Those three dark nights before we get the crescent. That's the new time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so important for, uh, especially now, but not just now, like I think um, in general, for us to reconnect to nature because it also allows us, like you say, to engage in relationship. And I, I love how you say that relationship because it has the word relate in it already. And I, I feel like it's so important to, um, to enter into that relationship so you also get to understand, you know, yourself, your own relationship and with the world around you. Um, and I, I know for a fact that so many people these days are waking up to the importance of reconnecting and relating to nature again in, in a, in a very sacred, uh, way that calls to their soul, their body and their spirit. And, um, I also love how you like keep it simple and make it very practical like here and now and um for for me like i'm just gonna say this like for me there's so much bullshit <laughs> around uh spirituality and as you were saying like spiritual bypass i see that so much and it's like very how can i say it's seductive because it shows like a, a fast track or like if you do this this that then you'll get there and then you'll be enlightened or you know whatever mm -hmm. and um and you know that that's a way for for some people i guess mm -hmm. but i feel for for me and that's like why why i feel that with you two that it's really about the embodiment and and the and that can only happen through really experiencing and um, I'm just uh, my curiosity goes to uh, the topic of how you were relating it from spirit to bone mm -hmm. so could you share a little bit more about that we think of well I think of bone as kind of our oldest DNA ancestral memory of that which is in our bones. Yeah. You, know, um, you may have heard some people have heard the reference to bone memory. Yeah. Like or, or more more often you you might have an elder, a grandmother or somebody that says, I know this on my bones. Mm. And yeah, they I might not them. know what they're saying, yeah. but to know something in your bones is to reference something that isn't part of your personal biography, but is older than you. Mm -hmm. The knowledge is older than, than your birth. Mm -hmm. um, so to know something in your bones is to have an, uh, a, a listening ear to the ancestors. Like, I know mm -hmm. this. I didn't learn it. I don't know how I know it. I just, this is true. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what is often meant when, when in Africa, I've often heard they say, uh, all, all, uh, all true learning is simply remembering. And so yeah. it's um, because when we when we align ourselves with the, the the gift that we came into the world to offer, and we start learn, you know, we go to school. And it's like, oh, and 
and, and you start having people pose about it. It's not like you're learning it. It's like, now what did you say? Let me learn this. It's, it's like, I know this. This is, yes, this is true. And so you just, oh, yes, yes. And, and, and uh, so you start, it's more like memory is getting activated rather than information is being put in there that you'll have to, you know, regurgitate and remember. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, the memory is already there. It's getting activated. It's like, yeah, what you're saying I know is true. I don't know how I know it. I don't remember if I, I don't remember ever hearing it, but I do know this. Uh, mm-hmm. and that kind of activation. Um, so where spirit meets the bone is a reference to uh, where the two worlds meet. Yeah. One of the, uh, when I give a lot of, uh, in my work with people in nature and as a wilderness guide uh, or ceremonial wilderness guide, like one, one exercise I might give somebody for a particular reason of working with that edge, that, where is that threshold? How do you know that place? Um, I'll say, you know, I want you to take a walk in nature. Um, and I would assign them probably to either go at night or as the sun is setting, because I just know about those particular times of day. And I say, I want you to take a walk in nature um, in, the, in the late evening um, and find the place where the two worlds meet. That's, that's your only instruction. Find mm. the place where the two worlds meet and go there and sit there for a while. Take your journal, listen, make an offering and and sit back, listen, maybe have a question that you take with you. Um, And they'll find some place in nature that mirrors something about that statement to them. Could be a rabbit hole, could be a little cave, could be a nest, it could be a a gnarly place that looks quite kind of challenging. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, this is, this feels like it. There and you sit at that threshold, um, and again make an offering, ask a question, and listen. Um, so that's uh, this again where spirit meets the bone is where the two worlds meet, mm-hmm. and, uh, and where the uh, the illusion of two worlds uh, vanishes. Mm-hmm. So that this thing we call the sacred and the profane, it, well, you know, it's all just one dance. Um, we just like to separate it because one feels better to us than the other. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> the one that feels good, we'll say that's the sacred, that's the, you know, connected with spirit, you know. Well, um, it's like, well, wait a minute, down here in the mud and the, and the tears and the mess, it's like, well, that's, that's that initiatory descent. That's the water, that's the healing and the memory and the belonging and the reconciliation. It's like, that's, that's where the dark soil is. Mm. And not just up there with the sunlight. Um, and this is down here and this is spirit. This is spirit too. Um, you can't really have just one, you know. No. <laughs> so when you go far enough down there, you'll find yourself up there. And if you keep chasing the light, you'll find yourself down there. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's also just how it works down here, right? Because it's still a dual, dual place. Mm-hmm. That's what I mean. It's, it's, it's yeah. we, we think in the duality. Yeah. Uh, but the paradox is there isn't a paradox, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we just like to frame it as such because it helps us navigate or feel important or whatever. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's, it's all, it, it's the moment we start classifying the sacred as only that which shines bright and feels good, we, we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah, just, it's, it's like it's all here. Yeah. And, um, so that's, uh, yeah. Before we, before we end, I want to um, maybe some other things you want to ask about, but I have a, a poem to end with. Um, that reminds me of kind of the all all the, all those challenges, all those different thresholds we go through. Like the one, say so we're in a threshold time right now on the planet of of that which that which we have known and how we've uh, operated, uh, we've we've severed from. Like it's not really going to work that way anymore. 
and yet we don't yet have the new one for most of us anyway we're in this the twixt in between place yeah so that we we'll call it the threshold time yeah so, so anything else I don't know where we are with our time how are we doing uh we're doing pretty good we're getting to uh closing time um so we're doing pretty pretty good yeah i no, i'm i'm more so wondering if you feel called to uh like share anything um, that you feel is important for the audience to know at this time other than your beautiful poem of course <laughs> um Yeah, I think uh, the thing I was thinking about was was something I had already said. I do have um, a, the the free gift I would like to share with people is a story, yeah. um, so that um, if have people email me or if you can uh, my email uh, being cater at rightsofpassagecouncil dot org. So it's k e d a r at and then writes r-i-t-e-s of passage council c-o-u-n-c-i-l if you email me i'll send you a free audio story uh, called singing stone that really exemplifies this process we're talking about this kind of this this search for that kind of guidance in, in difficult times and what one finds and how they find it um, oh beautiful uh, the it's a, a live uh, drumming story that I tell. I'd so like to offer that to your folks. Um, if they, again, just email me and I'll send it to you. That's perfect. I'm sure that will uh, assist a lot of people on their journey. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and so other than that, I could, I could share this other poem that's come up as we've been talking is, um, yeah. It's it's kind of knocking at the door saying, share me, share me. So me uh, <laughs> Love that. Knock it down here. Um, let's see, kind of scanning, scanning. Oh, there it is. Okay. <clears throat> so this one is called Thresholds and River Crossings. And uh, my one disclaimer is everything that I say in this poem actually happened. <laughs> wow. Um, thresholds and river crossings. Sometimes when walking through an ancient rainforest along the Northwest Pacific coast, deep in the belly of the Olympic Peninsula, you suddenly awaken from your well-worn path. You know, that one you've been walking a long time. A shaft of golden light passes through the trees in just the right way, anointing the feet of elders, holy ones, 800-year-old red cedar and Douglas fir. These lands of old growth cloaked in early morning mist whisper with ancient songs and stories. Awakened and illuminated, a thin place, a liminal space, <clears throat> an invitation to simply walk from here to there, from the blackened embers of old beliefs and identities into a more visible, alive, and wild indigenous self. <clears throat> Thresholds such as these require honor and respect, an offering of dried tobacco and yellow cornmeal for safe passage, a prayer to the ancestors to light the way placed gently in the burnt hollow of an ancient tree, enveloped there by earth and braided with roots and ash, offering accepted, entrance granted. You step through onto hallowed ground, consecrated by the soles of your feet on dark virgin soil, pulled forward by some mysterious force, unconcerned with the comforts of a life you have outgrown. Loving now silently those that you once loved out loud, you move across a landscape of memory and belonging, following the distant sounds of old church bells and river water. The most difficult crossings you don't see coming, and no warnings, 
the very nature of their existence flowing from some cold, clear, dark mountain spring deep in the underbrush of your psyche. So now you must cross this river and your attachment to everything and everyone you have known slips from your grasp. Some thresholds, they disappear behind you the moment you cross, offering no return and no forgiveness. Other crossings happen quickly. You barely noticing the slight wounding, the small scar inscribed into your skin by the silent gatekeepers at this threshold. The old ones remind us, offerings at such places must be made or they will be taken. There will be a loss. There's no way around it. Some thresholds bar your entry waiting for a wiser, more humble approach. And some are never to be crossed at all, for the price of doing so could be your soul. Some thresholds open for a moment, then close never to open again, while still others, like the flickering of fireflies on a warm summer evening, open and close and open and close again and again, offering a piercing light of liquid grace into the darker crevices of your mind. Some crossings can take years or even lifetimes to navigate, and like the bloodlines that have come before, footprints and heartbeats left in the ground, carrying the deep sacred storylines that are now etched into your face and hands. Not seduced by destinations or acquisitions, distractions on the journey, into the desert you now walk, dragging behind you the red prayer bundles of your people, human and non-human. The prayers of your descendants, human and non-human, calling you home to the one life you belong to. Future generations cry from another more distant mountain, leave us your medicine in the ground so that we may live. Four days and four nights, you sing and cry and pray. No food passes your lips. You smell of desert and sweat and fire. Something above calls your attention, an eagle feather falling from bright blue sky, outstretched hands, a prayer answered, a 300 year old spell finally broken. White hearts and desert bones draw new stories in the sands that counsel wash. The story of your passage and the forging of character and the crafting of an elder worked in deep by the underworld refiners fire and stone, medicine for the people, human and non-human. And after many years, many years and many crossings, you carry a shaft of golden light in your eyes a blessing for the one who, on some ordinary day, walks by your door on their way to some routine importance. And suddenly they find themselves in a rainforest without a compass or a trail marker or a whistle. And the old maps, they're of no use here, only deep listening. And the distant sounds of old church bells and river water. Oh. Even I get to feel a little bit of grief at the end of that one. <laughs> yeah. And if your um if your listeners remind me when they write for the uh the, the to get the link to download the story to Singing Stone, I'm happy to happy to send them a copy of that poem. Or both of them. You just need a, a prompting to remember. <laughs> Can I have a copy of that poem? <laughs> Certainly. I'll send you. I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. My goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you again for the invitation to, to chat with you and your listeners. Yeah. Thank you. It was very um, heartfelt. Yeah, very, uh, yeah, I'm almost feeling speechless. 
<laughs> which means that I'm deeply touched. <laughs> place where the where the, the language beyond words place yeah exactly yeah, yeah my well, favorite I, favorite what? words for the sacred are always great mystery because that it's the only thing that really can reference it <laughs> yeah for sure yeah for sure well thank you so much and uh i wish you a beautiful uh rest of your evening right Yes, we're, we're yeah. moving to 7 p.m. or a little bit after 7 now. Yeah. Nice. And uh, yeah. yeah, we'll stay in, in contact and uh, let you know. Thank you. Well, yeah, good good luck with your, your with your summit. And uh, curious to hear how it all goes. Thank you. Um, bye, listeners. See you soon. <laughs> Go well. Bye.